Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson, and I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. On today's program, Brian Lin tells us what one Japanese company is doing with unused rice. Later, Dan Novak presents this week's education report. We close with the next part of our U.S. history series. But first, here is Brian Lin. A Japanese company has found a way to turn unwanted rice into plastic goods. One company is working with farmers in the coastal town of Nami. Nearby is the Fukushima nuclear center, closed since a nuclear disaster there in March 2011. Jinichi Abe. Is a local rice farmer. He says people do not want to buy his rice because they worry it is radioactive. The farmer has been trying for years to recover from the economic effects of the disaster. Now he has a new way to sell his rice. Tokyo-based company Biomass Resin. Opened a factory in Nami in November. It turns locally grown rice into pellets for use in manufacturing. The pellets can be formed into all kinds of products, including plastic tools, food containers, shopping bags, and souvenirs. Without growing rice, this town can't recover. The 85-year-old Abe told Reuters news agency, "He said that in the years since the disaster, he has tried selling rice as animal feed, among other things. Even now, we can't sell it as Fukushima rice," Abe said. So having biomass come was a huge help. We can grow rice without worries. Officials ordered people in the area to flee when the nuclear factory's reactors exploded and released radiation. The government permitted some people to return to their lives in Nami in 2017 after a major cleanup of the area. About 80 percent of the town's land remains off limits. And currently, about two thousand people live there. About twenty-one thousand people lived in Nami before the accident. Town official Satoshi Kono admits things are still difficult for people in the area. We want businesses that will create as many jobs as possible, basically manufacturing, he said. Since 2017, eight companies have come back. These include a concrete manufacturing center and an electric vehicle battery recycler. Those companies created about 200 jobs. The town is under discussions with still more companies and research centers that might bring in more people. Takamitsu Imazu. Is president of Biomass Resin Fukushima. He told Reuters that even though the area has mostly recovered, the economy is still severely suffering. By building our factory here, we want to bring jobs and invite people back. Imazu says the plastic products created from rice are not biodegradable. Meaning they cannot be broken down into other material through natural processes. However, combining rice and plastic cuts down on the amount of carbon needed during production. He added, 
The company also says growing more rice in Nami reduces overall levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide. In addition, nuclear experts say rice naturally takes in little radioactive material. Biomass resin now employs ten people in Nami, including a twenty-year-old who returned, and the company hopes to expand. It uses only about fifty tons of Nami rice. The rest of the one thousand five hundred tons needed. Is mainly from elsewhere in Fukushima, but the company says it will buy a larger amount from Abe and his cooperative next year, grown on the freshly cleared fields. I'm Brian Lin. A federal government report from December found that half of all U.S. students. Started this school year behind their grade level in at least one subject. Many American education experts say tutoring is the best way to help students make up for learning loss during the COVID-19 pandemic. But although many schools have received a lot of federal aid, only a small number of students have been getting tutored. That finding comes from research by the nonprofit news organization Chalkbeat and the Associated Press. The two organizations surveyed twelve of the nation's school systems. Eight systems provided information. The schools reported that fewer than ten percent of students received any kind of tutoring in the fall of last year. A new tutoring group in Chicago served about three percent of students, officials said, but less than one percent of students in three big school systems received tutoring. They were Georgia's Gwinnett County, Florida's Miami-Dade County, and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Philadelphia reported that eight hundred students had been tutored. In those three systems, there are more than six hundred thousand students who spent no time in a tutoring program last fall. The low tutoring numbers suggest several problems. Some parents said they did not know tutoring was available, or did not think their child needed it. Some school systems have struggled to hire tutors. Other school systems said their small tutoring programs. Were part of their efforts to meet students' greatest needs. Whatever the reason, the result is clear: at an important time for students' recovery, millions of children have not received the extra help. It works. It's effective. It gets students to improve in their learning and catch up," said Amy Rapaport. She is a researcher with the University of Southern California, or USC, who is studying why so many students are not getting intensive tutoring. The Indianapolis school district last year began two tutoring programs that connect students with teachers by video link. One is available to all students after school. The other is offered during the day. For some low-performing schools, district officials said the tutoring test program improved student test scores. Parents also liked the program. The two programs served 3,200 students last fall. That is about 17 percent of students in district schools. Two other tutoring programs operate at a small number of schools. The school district also said that only 35 percent of the students who registered for after-school tutoring last fall attended more than one session. Mark Ransford is the Indianapolis Public Schools spokesperson. He said the district wants to improve attendance and hopes to sign up more students for tutoring next school year. A federal survey from December 
found schools reported that about 10% of students received intensive tutoring several days a week. The real number could be lower. Only 2% of U.S. households said their children are getting intensive tutoring, a study from USC found. Schools trying to increase tutoring face problems, including hiring and planning. Experts say tutoring is most effective when provided three times a week for at least 30 minutes during school hours. Offering after-school or weekend tutoring is simpler, but attendance is often low. Low family interest has been another problem. Although test scores sharply dropped during the pandemic, many parents do not believe their children experienced learning loss. In Wake County, North Carolina, the school district began planning a reading tutoring program in November. District officials last month said volunteers are tutoring fewer than 140 students. That is far fewer than the 1,000 students the program was designed to help. Many worry that not enough students are getting the help they need even as programs continue to grow. I'm Dan Novak. You just heard Dan Novak present this week's education report. Dan joins me now to talk more about his story. Hey, Dan, welcome back. Happy as always to be on the show, Ashley. This week's story centered on tutoring efforts in schools. Can you tell us a bit more about what tutoring is? Basically, tutoring is extra help for students outside of the classroom. Usually, a tutor teaches just one student at a time, or maybe a small group. In high school, I had a math tutor and a chemistry tutor. Both of those subjects weren't my strongest, so it was really good for me to have the extra help. But I had private tutors. The story is centered on tutors hired through the school. There seems to be a lot of need for more tutoring, but not many students are getting that extra help. Why is that? It's a bit of a confusing problem. After the pandemic, it is clear that a lot of students are behind in their schoolwork. More than half of all American students are behind grade level in at least one subject, which is a pretty amazing figure. Education experts agree that tutoring is really important for academic recovery, but just a few students are actually being tutored. Education experts cite several reasons why the numbers are so low. One, it is simply difficult to hire the number of tutors that are necessary to meet the need. Two, scheduling can be hard. If tutoring is scheduled on the weekend or after school, for example, attendance is likely to be lower. Three, schools say they are only tutoring those with the greatest need, and that's why numbers are lower. And finally, parents might not be aware that their children need the help. That was what your story was about last week. Yeah, exactly. Many school systems aren't communicating very well with parents about their children's struggles. Other parents just don't think their child is struggling. So that's a big problem that schools are going to need to solve. Parents can't help solve a problem they don't know exists. Well, thanks again, Dan, for this interesting and important report. You're welcome, Ashley. Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. Larry West and Tony Riggs continue the story of President Woodrow Wilson. In 1917, Europe was at war. It was the conflict known as World War I. After three years of fighting, Europe's lands were filled with the sights and sounds of death. But still, the armies of the Allies and the Central Powers continued to fight. 
The United States had tried to keep out of the European conflict. It declared its neutrality. In the end, however, neutrality was impossible. Germany was facing starvation because of a British naval blockade. To break the blockade, German submarines attacked any ship that sailed to Europe. That included ships from neutral nations, like the United States. The German submarines sank several American ships. Many innocent people were killed. German submarine attacks finally forced the United States into the war. It joined the Allies, Britain, France, and Russia. Like most Americans, President Wilson did not want war, but he had no choice. Sadly, he asked Congress for a declaration of war. Congress approved the declaration on April 6, 1917. It was not long before American soldiers reached the European continent. They marched in a parade through the streets of Paris. The people of France gave them a wild welcome. They cheered the young Americans. They threw flowers at the soldiers and kissed them. The Americans marched to the burial place of the Marquis de Lafayette. Lafayette was the French military leader who had come to America's aid during its war of independence from Britain. The United States wanted to repay France for its help more than a hundred years earlier. An American army officer made a speech at the tomb. He said, Lafayette, we are here. And so the Americans were there. They were ready to fight in the bloodiest war the world had ever known. Week by week, more American troops arrived. By October 1917, the American army in Europe totaled 100,000 men. The leader of that army was General John J. Pershing. Pershing's forces were not sent directly into battle. Instead, they spent time training, building bases, and preparing supplies. Then, a small group was sent to the border between Switzerland and Germany. The Americans fought a short but bitter battle there against German forces. The Germans knew the American soldiers had not fought before. They tried to frighten the Americans by waving their knives and guns in a fierce attack. The Americans surprised the Germans. They stood and fought back successfully. Full American participation in the fighting did not come for several months. It came only after another event took place. That event changed the war and the history of the 20th century. It was the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. Its leader was Vladimir Lenin. The Russian Revolution began in the spring of 1917. The people of that country were tired of fighting Germany, and they were tired of their ruler, Tsar Nicholas. The Tsar was overthrown. A temporary government was established. It was headed by Alexander Kerensky. President Woodrow Wilson sent a team of American officials to Russia to help Kerensky's new government. The officials urged Russia 
to remain in the war. Under Kerensky, Russia did keep fighting, but it continued to suffer terrible losses. Many Russians demanded an end to the war. Lenin saw this opposition as a way to gain control of the government. So he went to the city of Petrograd. There he led the opposition to the war and to Kerensky. Night after night he spoke to big crowds. What do you get from war? he shouted. Only wounds, hunger, and death. Lenin promised peace under Bolshevik communism. Within a few months, he won control of the Petrograd Soviet. That was an organization of workers and soldiers. Kerensky's government continued to do badly in the war. More and more Russian soldiers lost hope. Many fled the army. Others stayed but they refused to fight. The end came in November 1917. Soldiers in Petrograd turned against Kerensky. Lenin ordered them to rebel, and he took control of the government within 48 hours. Russia was now a communist nation. As promised, Lenin called for peace. So Russia signed its own peace treaty with Germany. The treaty forced Russia to pay a high price for its part in the war. It had to give up a third of its farmland, half of its industry, and 90% of its coal mines. It also lost a third of its population. Still, it did not have real peace with Germany. The treaty between Russia and Germany had a powerful influence on the military situation in the rest of Europe. Now Germany no longer had to fight an enemy on two fronts. Its eastern border was quiet suddenly. It could aim all its forces against Britain, France, and the other allies on its western border. Germany had suffered terrible losses during four years of war. Many of its soldiers had been killed. And many of its civilians had come close to starving because of the British naval blockade. Yet Germany's leaders still hoped to win. They decided to launch a major attack. They knew they had to act quickly before the United States could send more troops to help the Allies. German military leaders decided to break through the long battle line that divided most of Central Europe. They planned to strike first at the north end of the line. British troops held that area. The Germans would push the British off the continent and back across the English Channel. Then they would turn all their strength on France. When France was defeated, Germany would be victorious. The campaign opened in March 1918. German forces attacked British soldiers near Amiens, France. The Germans had 6,000 pieces of artillery. The British troops fought hard, but could not stop the Germans. They were pushed back 50 kilometers. The attack stopped for about a week. Then the Germans struck again. This time their target was Ypres, Belgium. The second attack was so successful 
it seemed the Germans might push the British all the way back to the sea. The British commander, Field Marshal Douglas Haig, ordered his men not to withdraw. Haig said, There is no other course open to us but to fight it out. The British fought hard and stopped the attack. Losses on both sides were extremely high. Yet the Germans continued with their plan. Their next attack was northeast of Paris in May. This time they broke the Allied line easily and rushed toward Paris. The German army chief, General Erich Ludendorff, tried to capture the French capital without waiting to strengthen his forces. He got close enough to shell the city. The French government prepared to flee. Allied military leaders rushed more troops to the area. The new force included two big groups of American Marines. The heaviest fighting was outside Paris at a place called Bellow Wood. The American Marines were advised to prepare for a possible withdrawal. One Marine said, Withdrawal? We just got here. The Marines resisted as the Germans attacked Allied lines in Bellow Wood again and again. Then they attacked the German lines. The battle for Bellow Wood lasted three weeks. It was the most serious German offensive of the war. The Germans lost. Mm -hmm. 